One more deep breath and we shall begin. So thank you everyone. I know for some of you it's quite late, for some of you it's quite early, depending where you are in the world, but I'm glad you could find this time to join us. Um, my name is Jolda Betancourt and I am a donor relations officer with Nonviolent Peace Force. Um, it is really my pleasure to be the person who's starting us off today on this phone call, uh, Zoom call, uh, regarding the third Harmony film. I wanna let a, you folks know a few things. If you just entered the call, people are entering where they're calling from and what inspired them about the third Harmony. Um, I'd also like to let you know that Everyone's on mute. It's so strange to see so many of us and we're all so quiet, but that's because you've been muted. And in the future, when we're gonna do the Q&A session, we're gonna put our questions in the chat box. Um, I will introduce several people from the film who uh, we are really lucky to have here as part of this conversation. So you'll be able to see some of the folks who are actually in the film, in addition to the director and the film editor. Um, you can direct your questions later on in the Q&A session to any of these folks, um, or you can just ask a general question, whatever you feel called to do. Um, once I've introduced those folks, I'm going to also be introducing you to Michael Nagler and Sarah Gorslein, um, and they will be responding to your questions. At the end of the cafe, we ask that you click on a link that will be provided in the chat box to respond to a survey. We really wanna know how we're doing and how we can improve. And we will also provide you with a list of all the organizations that are represented in this film. And we hope that you will find that to be a wonderful resource as well. So let me begin. Um, I was really honored to be able to start us off on this call because the Meta Center for Nonviolence and Nonviolent Peace Force are two groups of people, two organizations that are really close to my heart. I think that they are really basically two sides of the same coin. Uh, the Meta Center for Nonviolence helps people know and learn about nonviolence as best as possible. And Nonviolent Peace Force is a wonderful example of an organization that shows us what can happen in our world when we actually apply what we've learned about nonviolence. It's the very practical side of the study of nonviolence has made available. So um, I love them both because it's not just studying and it's not just action. When they work together, then you have a real power going into play. So I don't want, you know, to not delay it any further and to keep folks from um, meeting some of the folks that we have here on this call. Let me begin with the presentations. So the first person that I would like to call upon and please be ready to unmute yourself is Kazu Haga. I'm going to ask Kazu to introduce himself and to also share with us why he finds the third Harmony film to be important. Um, and I'm gonna ask these of, of all our guests. So Kazu, if you can unmute and join us. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon for wherever you may be calling from. My name is Kazu Haga. I'm the founder of the East Point Peace Academy and author of a book called Healing Resistance. And I'm calling from Oakland, California. And uh, yeah, so much I could say to that question. But I, um, over the last seven years or so, I've been doing a lot of trauma healing work in the prisons here in California and doing a lot of restorative dialogues between incarcerated people and the people that they harmed. And I've learned a lot about how trauma works on an interpersonal level. And I think a lot of what we're witnessing in society is um, trauma responses happening at scale. And so we see a lot of trauma happening in society in the United States where I'm at, uh, you see a lot of it manifesting in politics. Uh, if you look at all of like how trauma manifests on, on individual people, we see that happening throughout society. And we're oftentimes responding to that trauma from our own trauma response. 
And so it's just trauma meeting trauma, and it's not a very healing way to try to create change. And I think one of the things that nonviolence offers us is an opportunity for us to look at our own trauma and heal through our own trauma and be intentional about how we engage with the trauma of other people. And so I think it's something that uh, now more than ever is is really, really needed. So really grateful for a film like The Third Harmony to, to be out there and, and to be uh, starting this conversation with so many people. Thank you, Kazu. I appreciate that. And I would like to invite the next person who I hope is on the call, um, Ken Budigan. If you are with us, could you unmute yourself? Right. So wonderful to be with all of you. Love this film. Thank you so much for all of those who created it, Michael and everyone else. Uh, I uh, teach it peace, justice, and conflict studies program at DePaul University. And I work with Pachebene Nonviolence Service. Our main job in the 21st century is to mainstream active, creative, challenging, audacious nonviolence. I think we get through this century if we can do that well. And uh, this film is such an important contribution to that process. It's a kind of film I've been hoping my whole life to, to see emerge. So glad it's here. So glad I'm working with all of you and uh, uh, look forward to seeing that people everywhere are able to see this film. So very happy to be here. Great, thank you. The next person I would like to um, speak, if possible, is Derek Oakley. Derek, are you with us? Hi everybody. I am Derek Oakley. I'm a NGO worker, a peace worker, and I've also just completed a PhD on unarmed civilian protection, focusing primarily on the work of nonviolent peace force. I believe that for there to be developments and advancements in the dialogue about nonviolence and its utility and efficacy in our world, that we need to have reference both to the moral arguments and a rich lineage of nonviolence and to different scientific empirical arguments to make a case. And I think that this film is a very um, timely and telling contribution on both those fronts. Great, thank you, Derek. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, invite our very own co-founder of Nonviolent Peace Force, David Harto. David, I saw you on the call. If you would like to just say a few words, love to hear them. Uh, good morning. Hello, everyone. Um, David Hartso from San Francisco, uh, co-founder of Nonviolent Peace Force and uh, World Beyond War. And uh, I love to see so many beautiful faces. Um, I am very excited about this film because I think it, it is uh, not only saying no to the uh, madness of uh, violence and war, but is saying yes to a very positive alternative. And uh, I think it can help give hope <laughs> to, all, to a world that really needs some hope. Thank you for everyone that uh, was involved in making it and carrying out the message in their lives and their work. Great. Thank you, David. And I don't know if Sherry Mitchell is with us. Um, it wasn't clear whether she'd be able to join us, and I haven't seen her in, on, in the list. But if Sherry, if you're here, okay, she may have not been one of the people to be able to join us. Um, Lindsay, Lindsay Bersina, hope you're here. Maybe not. Okay, I'll call back for Lindsay um, in a moment. And the next person would be, very appropriately, our other co-founder of Nonviolent Peace Force, Mel Duncan. Well, thanks. Um, first of all, there, there were many co-creators of Nonviolent Peace Force. Um, and I don't say that with false modesty. Uh, there was so, so much history and energy that went into creating NP. I work as the um, 
Director for Advocacy for Nonviolent Peace Force. And a week after George Floyd was murdered, the Minneapolis Public School Board uh, did not voted to not renew their contract with the Minneapolis police to provide police in the high schools. Uh, instead, they uh, hired security specialists and uh, contracted with Nonviolent Peace Force to train them. Uh, and so this happened three weeks ago, a uh, five day training. And the first day was a little rough. Uh, people coming in, not really having a background in nonviolence, wondering, you know, who the heck are these people? What are they talking about? So the second morning, we used this film and it set the context and, and gave a perspective floor that lended credibility to everything else that we did for the rest of the week. And so it was very, very valuable. So thanks everyone who, who worked on this. Thank you, Mel. Um, the next person I would like to call on is Rivera Sun. Rivera, are you with us? I am, thank you, Gilda. Uh, thank you all for joining this uh, wonderful gathering of people. It's quite a reflection as the film is on how broad and deep and wide the, the movement for nonviolence always has been and always will be and is really emerging to our awareness right now. I'm Rivera Sun, I'm an author and an activist, and I actually work with many of the organizations that are on the call today and um, celebrate and support the work of others. Uh, I think the, the film is a great way of reflecting in a new way uh, in our culture on how the story, the science, and the spirituality of nonviolence have really turned a corner in how we can articulate them together. So it's a very exciting thing, and I'm really honored to be here with all of you today. Great. Thank you, Rivera. It's wonderful. Um, I would also now like to call on Kai Brand Jacobson. Kai, are you there? I am. Thank you very much. The first thing I would like to express is simply my profound gratitude and appreciation for those who've made this film and for everyone whose work it shares and everyone who is engaged in this work every single day around the world. Um, it is an extraordinary opportunity to be here and to see so many good friends. I have spent most of the last 20, 25 years of my life working in peace building, in the prevention of armed violence, and working to help communities and countries recover and heal after the, the visible and invisible impacts and effects of violence and war. I think what stuck with me while watching this film, as so many of us know, we're living in a critical moment now. The scale of the crises and the challenges we're facing is growing and our capacity to handle them, to address them effectively is not at the scale it needs to be. Nonviolence is a critical component, a, a powerful force, philosophy, vision and tool in working to address conflicts within the far larger family, as I see it, of peace building. And what we need to grow is our capacity to address conflicts effectively and practically through peaceful means. So that someday, some years from now, children around the world will have to go into a museum to know what a soldier or what war was. But every single child and adult in this world will grow up knowing and understanding nonviolence and peaceful, proven, and effective ways of dealing with conflicts. And this video was a powerful clarion call to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kai. That's wonderful. And I'm going to give Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Versina, Lindsay Rose Versina, if you're out there, one more opportunity to introduce yourself. I know she's juggling a lot, so there's very possibility she may not be, but maybe she'll join us a bit later as we go into this call. So now I'm going to take the opportunity to introduce one more person who is also in the film, our very own Nonviolent Peace Forces Executive Director, 
Tiffany Easton, who will be introducing two people very much responsible for this film. So it's my pleasure to hand it out over to Tiffany. Great. Thanks so much, Gilda, and hello, everybody. Nice to be back together again, for those of you who have been in our other cafes, and that's nice to see new faces. I can only echo what's already been said about the, the distinct honor and pleasure to be together with this group of people today here in this call, and certainly uh, with the group of people uh, who were featured in the film and who made the film. Uh, so it's such a great opportunity. I'm a, I'm, I've, I'm a big fan and very happy to support and promote this film. I think it, it's, a, it's a tool, uh, as we've heard from some of the examples, uh, that is so relevant. It's so easily accessible. It makes the idea of nonviolence accessible and understandable and concrete and real uh, to people who who have yet to really been in, be introduced or really understand uh, what that power is. And this is what we need to be able to continue to move forward. Uh, so it's very exciting. And we're already working on all the different ways we can incorporate uh, utilizing this film in, in NP's work with our staff, with our partners, with, our, with the communities we work with in the various countries around the world. Uh, and so it's a, again, an honor and a privilege to be together um, and fun to be with you all. So this is great. And it is also my distinct honor and privilege to be able to, to introduce those who made this film possible. Uh, first, let me introduce Michael Nagler, who I'm sure most, if not everybody on the call knows or knows of. Michael, of course, is he's an author, he's an, a peace educator, he's an activist. Uh, he's very importantly for many of us, a mentor, uh, a friend, uh, and the, the, the heart and soul behind this film. Um, he who, who brought it to life. Uh, and together with Michael, I'd also like to introduce Sarah Gorslein, uh, who is an editor, uh, film working on films, uh, particularly documentaries in the field of social justice, uh, and clearly very talented in pulling a story together uh, and doing that very, very difficult work of taking uh, so much information and somehow putting it together in a story that works for us all. Uh, and it's my distinct pleasure to, uh, to introduce them both to us all here today and to call upon Michael and Sarah to say some words uh, and introduce how the film came to be, uh, what, the, what went in the behind the scenes, the making of, and what they hope will come, what they hope will, how the film will be used going forward. So perhaps Michael, we start with you. There we go. Thank you so much, Tiffany. It, uh, it really, I feel very, very moved uh, to be here. I've been uh, on events almost nonstop for uh, about a month now, panel after panel. People are getting tired of me calling on them and saying, would you be on a panel? But, but I have to say, this is very, very special. This Simonetta, whom I haven't seen for about 10 years, and Timo, who's translating the film uh, into, into Finnish. Uh, and what a wonderful group. It just makes me remember something that I once said when I was at a meeting of Yes Magazine, where I just felt, you know, could we just close the door and be the world? <laughs> but of course, that would be hopelessly re unrealistic. What I want to say about the creation of the film is uh, that, you know, we, it's a cliche, it's a truism to say, I wasn't doing it, uh, that it, something was doing it. And I was very pleased to be used as an instrument. I've been trying to get this done for, you know, close to 20 years. And suddenly everything came together and it, it flowed. And I have to say, it, it's not only the wonderful product that we created, but the process was the closest to feeling that uh, I was, as St. Francis says, I was made an instrument of peace. It, it was also extremely enjoyable to work with Sarah, who was, ex I mean, from the minute that we met, I knew, Sarah, you were the one to do this, but I didn't really know at that time yet what a genius you were at 
grasping the essence of nonviolence and as people have already said, making it into a story that, that is so effective. And it took me a while to uh, get over the pain of losing some of my favorite ideas, but <laughs> I, I came to realize after a while that uh, Sarah knew what she was talking about. And uh, among all of the people that we, that just came together and made this thing happen, uh, that certainly was a high point for me. For those of you who may not be aware of it, the film, uh, I mean, as if that were not amazing enough, it suddenly these other things, other deliverables, if you will, came flooding in. And so we now have a book with the same title, Third Harmony, Nonviolence and the New Story of Human Nature, and a uh, the film, and a board game called Cosmic Peace Force. So it's, that's to make nonviolent Peace Force a little bit jealous or a bit ambitious for the future. <laughs> uh, and we are now launching, thanks to uh, Stephanie Van Hook Meta's executive director, we're launching a multimedia cross-media campaign. Sarah is all ready to go. She's presented us with a list of uh, clips from the film because we have, over 35 hours of superb uh, interview with many of you who are on this film, uh, on this call, I mean. And uh, needless to say, just 40 minutes of that have been extracted for the film. So there's a lot more that we can do. And among other you know, minor miracles that happened along the way, I can't fail to mention S Jim Schuyler who's been on our board for a long, long time. I had no idea that Jim had changed careers and he was now writing music for documentaries. So he said he would take on this project and he, he did it. The music is just wonderful. Many people have commented on how moving and appropriate it is. And it's now available on a DVD. As you can probably guess, Tiffany, I could go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> but I would just so love to hear from Sarah and everybody else that I will stop here. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Sarah Gorslein, the video editor, as mentioned, and it's such a privilege to be in this group of just incredibly powerful activists. Uh, it's so moving to actually meet and see some of you that I feel like I already know through interviews, having worked with so much of the footage. Um, I guess I'd like to say, you know, I work throughout the Bay Area and, um, and around the country for different clients, mainly in documentary, as mentioned, and um, mainly doing work around social justice and environmental justice. Um, I came to this project really as a beginner, in a way, in nonviolence. I knew about as much as your average American about what nonviolence is. And like a lot of people, I picture nonviolence as a protest out in the streets, you know. And so a lot of what this project has brought to me is the awareness of the most intimate circle of nonviolence, the interpersonal conflict resolution aspect of nonviolence and the internal healing that needs to occur in order for nonviolent work to actually take place. Um, and another aspect is that international scale of nonviolence. I had never actually even, I wasn't familiar with unarmed civilian protection when I came to this project. So. Um, I, you know, I knew of isolated incidents of that, but I think, um, you know, learning about nonviolent peace force has really revealed this whole other le level of nonviolence that can be done in very um, adverse circumstances, as you all know. Um, and I think that's what's so powerful um, is, is learning that this, this work can actually function on the ground, even in very dangerous and difficult circumstances. Um, and that the knowledge and work that Michael has done throughout his career and all of this uh, back information that we have can be used to roll out actual campaigns on the ground. Um, and so we really work to structure the film in three acts to really bring this information super clearly to people, um, almost like a primer, a nonviolence handbook, like, like Michael's handbook that he has, that people could very quickly and easily pick this up, why it works, how we can practice it, how, why we train for nonviolence work, and then how this can be used in their personal lives through the five tools that we bring at the end of the film. Um, and it was very important for us to have concrete tools that people could take when they left the theater or the, you know, left their office <laughs> to go out into the world and, and do things with this, with this information. 
Um, so what I really see in, in the film myself is I see it as a beginning of a roadmap and the Meta Center actually has a roadmap diagram that they use often for their nonviolence education that I encourage everyone to go check out on the Meta Center's website. But to me, the, the word roadmap kept coming up in, when I'm, as I moved through this project. This is the beginning of a set of directions for us. And I felt as an American, like I really needed these directions these last four years, right? We've been in such a challenging period. And so I feel that this film is so relevant to, to what we're all um, struggling with right now in terms of um, how we get our personal uh, uh, baggage in order, in order to go out and, and be ready to meet the world in a way that's really effective and meaningful, and that can help move some of these movements ahead on the ground. Um, and I wanted to mention, you know, we, we chose to feature a nonviolent peace force in the film, partly because we had incredible interviews with both David Hartsoe and Mel Duncan. Um, and those were incredibly helpful and informative to the to building the film in general. We also saw nonviolent peace force as you know, proof for folks who are skeptics about this work that this, this can actually work on the ground. And the incredible story that Derek and Andres tell in the film of their intervention nonviolently in South Sudan is just an incredible example of a moment where nonviolence functions to change the dynamic. And Tiffany has just been incredibly helpful in explaining those dynamics throughout the film. Um, so I just really want to thank Tiffany also for your um, sort of giving us the larger context of why this work actually functions on the ground um, through your experience. Um, so I'm just so privileged to be here. I'm so happy to have worked on this project. Um, Michael and I would always bring up the phrase an embarrassment of riches, which is what we felt we had to work with on this. And so as Michael mentioned, we're now going to be working on a set of special features, which will um, dive a little deeper into some of these topics, you know, things like mirror neurons that we only could touch on, um, but we might want to take a little bit of a deeper dive for a two, two minute clip for some of these things. So we're going to be working on some of those now. But um, thank you all so much for the work you do out in the world. It's so nice to see your faces and to actually be able to meet some of you for the first time in person uh, over Zoom. Um, and yeah, just thank you so much for your work. Thank you both. You were both very disciplined with time. Very impressed. Uh, I had a little laugh when, when Sarah and you weren't the first person to say so, meeting in person. I think it's a, a reflection of 2020 for us. We've spent so much time on Zoom. It feels like this is the new, new normal for meeting in person, isn't it? Well, great. What a great way to start off the conversation. And thank you so much, both Michael and Sarah, for that, that look into how the film came to be. So now we've got some time to, to have a discussion, which is always the best way to, to, to move forward and have these conversations. So uh, because there's so many of us on the call, so to, to keep things um, moving along, the best thing to do if you would like to make an in intervention or if you have a question, if you could just write it in the chat window, I'll keep an eye on that. Um, and we'll, you, if you've got a question that you'd like a certain person, a specific person to answer, please go ahead um, and uh, identify the, the person or persons you'd like to speak or no, hear more from. Um, and if it's just more of a general question, that's okay, put that in too, and we can, we can throw it out to the group and see who might want to, want to participate or just your own experiences, reflections, um, uh, further reflections uh, on nonviolence in the film that you'd like to share. And while you're giving some thought to that, we do have a couple of questions we've received already. So I'll, I'll kick us off with those. Um, and this one's gonna be a general one and I, I'm gonna put it out and maybe uh, start throw this one to you, Michael, as a starter. Uh, Vera Edmonds sent in a, a question in advance saying, I enjoyed the film, but wonder about some people such as Donald Trump who are psychologically ill. Early on in the movie, it was said that we can all choose nonviolence. Seems like some folks have lost that ability. Any comments about this? Yeah, yeah that, as you said, Tiffany, that is not an easy question to start off with. He's not an easy case to start off with. And the pillars of support that put him in a position of such power, uh, it's something that's just appalling and we need to analyze and resist very carefully. Um, the, th the image of humanity on which the whole theory of nonviolence rests from you know, Gandhi onward and, and less articulately back into the grave beginnings of history is that every human being 
is redeemable. Every human being has within him or herself the capacity to wake up. And what we really do in a nonviolence interaction is we reflect back to our opponent, whether they're on Zoom or face to face or never heard of us, we reflect back to them our awareness of that inner dignity and that inner sense of connectedness, which can never be extinguished. It can be very, very seriously covered over as it is in the case of the individual that Vera's question was about. And it does mean that sometimes in nonviolence, we don't see the results that we wanted when we wanted them. This is at Meta, we call this work versus work. You know, you can get something to work. Uh, but as Erica Chenoweth points out and Maria Stefan in their book, you can have a failed nonviolent uprising will do the world more good than a successful violent uprising. They are four times more likely to lead to democratic reforms down the line, even when they fail. Which says to me, that it is operating below the level of consciousness and it never fails to do that work. So we have to be realistic. We can't uh, put that person <laughs> whose name I hesitate to use actually, can't put him on a couch and give him the 25 years of therapy and replace, you know, heal the wounds that his upbringing left him with and then change the structure. We have to do things to prevent him from doing his damage for his own benefit as well as ours. Uh, but we must never, I think, lose faith that that redemption, that awakening is possible. Thank you so much, Michael. And Kai, I know you've got some thoughts about this. Would you like to have make some comments? Thank you very much, Tiffany. Actually, the, the question immediately brought to my mind when Gandhi was asked, what would you do about Adolf Hitler? And one of the things that Gandhi responded was, well, I wouldn't have waited so long. I would start <laughs> earlier. But part of the core point is it is truly not about Gandhi, uh, sorry, about Hitler. It is truly not about Trump. And this is something that is fundamental to an understanding of the application of nonviolence. We need to understand and look at what has enabled Trump to reach this level of power. What are the, the structural, cultural, societal conditions and factors? And there are some critical ones that if we want to begin having a real conversation about how to address this, it's important for us to look at. One is control of the media. Trump did not win the first election. He did not do so well in this election. The creation of Trump did. That's everywhere from the creation of Trump around the um, TV show that he used to be a host of to the incredibly well-planned, well-organized media instrument and machine that has been behind him throughout this. And here I'm speaking about Fox News. I'm speaking about Breitbart News, Infowars, the steady takeover over a period of 30 years of local radio stations in the United States by organizations supporting extreme right-wing um, agendas. And currently today, you are having millions upon millions of citizens in the US being flooded every day with systematic fake news and misinformation following a very clear agenda. And what you're not having is what is a fundament to any democratic society, reasoned discussion based around different points of view, where I have the ability to hear you, you hear me, we may not agree, but we try to find common positions or better solutions together. Um, you need to look at control of the media because right now you have a private oligopoly of it in the United States and that's affecting. We need to look at the changes both within our countries and globally that have led to a point where today we have more innovation scientific, technological, creative capability than we've ever had as a species. And yet you have eight men who have more personal wealth than 3.5 billion people put together. So there are societal and structural factors. And as long as we continue to not address those, then we will create the conditions for Hitler's, Trump's, Erdogan, Xi, Putin, Duterte, and many others to come to power. It's interesting that in our world today, we have perhaps more old 
male chauvinist misogynists in power actually governing every one of the world's largest countries than we have had in recent history. And we need to work to bring about a deep shift. It is nonviolent action and demonstrations are critical. But what was beautiful with Gandhi and uh, nonviolence in India was they also had what they called the constructive program. There was much, much more than just trying to get rid of the British Empire. There was also looking at how to positively address the real needs. Sorry, I've spoken too much, but just the last point to, to say, which is critical, the overwhelming majority of the 70 million plus citizens in the United States who voted for Trump did not, as many people who I truly love in the US are, are wrestling with this angst, how could they vote for this hate, this misogyny, this racism? They didn't. Because what they're getting is completely different information, which when you look at fact checking has more falsity than Pravda in the old Soviet Union did or Ceausescu's propaganda here in Romania. What they voted for was someone that they hear every day is fighting the good fight, is standing up for them, is representing their values. They live and hear a completely different information reality. And a lot of people voted for very basic things that any one of us would as well. Someone who stands up for their interests and is representing them. They're not getting the image, the messages and everything else of hate. And I know, yes, you can say, well, they can't avoid it. It's there, but it's, it's just such a dichotomy. So we need to address that and begin to rebuild and reweave the fabric of our societies and have healthy social, economic, political systems so that we don't create the worlds in which Hitler's and Trump's come to power. Sorry for speaking too much. Thanks, thanks, Guy. Guy, um, I was I was just noting Tebow's brought his family into the into the screen. It's great. This is the ideal scenario. We've got a young person on the call, um, and maybe there's more out there I don't see, but that made me very excited to see. Uh, Mel, would you mind answering a question? Uh, it's going to be about Tiananmen Square. Pamela asked, "What would NP have? What advice would NP have given to the demonstrators in Tiananmen Square um, had that been possible?" Uh, it would be presumptuous for us uh, to give them advice. I, uh, I think that uh, if we were to have been invited. Uh, by the uh, leaders of that uh, movement, which I still maintain uh, was successful. Not as successful as the leaders wanted, but there was success to that movement. I would anticipate that we would have been invited uh, much earlier on. Um, and we could have looked at strategies of civilian protection that would complement the civilian resist the civil resistance that was going on so as to mitigate the violence that was uh, just uh, uh, waved over the uh, uh, many of the protesters uh, who were killed and injured and we would have worked with them again if we were invited um, on uh, protection strategies that could be in place that would have given them perhaps more space uh, to get their message out and to maintain their message over uh, a longer period of time. Thanks, Mel. That's great. And Michael, I think you had some thoughts about this question as well. Yeah, because this is an issue that uh, was agonizing for me uh, personally, and one of the things that really launched me into the Meta Center's current mission, which is to help people practice nonviolence more safely and more effectively. And it was terribly frustrating for me and others who were in the nonviolence world at that time. If I could add a couple of things to what, what you said, Mel. One is they were violating a well-known Gandhian principle called principle of non-embarrassment. The uh, Chinese regime asked the students in the square to vacate the square while they were being visited by the Russian leader, but they refused to do it. So they had an ideal opportunity there to not embarrass the regime, not embarrass the country, and to do what we call uh, 
an act of gradual reciprocated uh, tension reduction of making them an offer, that, uh, compromising, being able to compromise on something that was not the main issue. And then this brings me to the other point, which is uh, they should have been doing at that time dispersive, not collective action to use the, the uh, parlance that uh, scholars use today. And they should not have mistaken the symbol, which was the square for the issue, which was democratic reform in China. And uh, uh, David Hartso, you've also written very well about that, but it was, it was very frustrating for us watching those mistakes, knowing they were walking into a death trap and not being able to do anything to prevent it. So today we know so much more about how to do this. I mean, you know, Daniel Hunter has, has written beautifully about the tactic is not the issue and so forth. Uh, I'm so encouraged by the growth in sophistication of nonviolent movements and of course, NP is doing a terrific job in collecting best practices around the world. So let, in fact, I just will close by saying that uh, we were contacted by the Sudanese uprising, thanks to our connection with Pramila Jayapal. And they were in exactly the same situation. They were masked in the main square in Khartoum. And we were not the only ones, but there were others saying, you know, let, don't let this be Tiananmen Square. They then fanned out into the countryside to do the educational work, which was necessary, as Kai has just been pointing out. And they, it, it led to success. And we see once again, nonviolence is invincible if you do it right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to send this one out to anybody who might want to take it up. We've got a question from John Fairfield. How can a community defend itself against a violent mafia or gang, which is extracting money from businesses and persons in the community? Anybody want to jump in on that? I'm happy to offer a few few words. Um, Thank you, Cassie. In the in the Chicago movement during the civil rights movement, uh, they were successful in actually recruiting some of the local gangs to act as peace marshals during the marches because they knew that when they were holding nonviolent marches, the street gangs were potentially one of the groups that could incite violence. And so, rather than waiting for that violence to happen, they went and asked and and gave uh, the the street gangs a role in the movement. Now, famously, James Bevel had to get beaten up by the gang multiple times in order to recruit them, right? James Bevel went to the gang and, and tried to recruit them to become peace marshals. He got beaten up. The next day, he went again and asked again. He got beaten up. The next day, he went again and asked again and got beaten. And at some point, the gang realized how serious Bevel was and, and somehow won their respect. Now, obviously, they don't, that's not the only way to do it, right? There's also in Chicago other uh, stories of... Um, some church people who organize mothers and grandmothers to organize kind of rallies to, to, to um, fight the street gangs um, because, you know, everyone respects moms and grandmas, right? So I think nonviolence has uh, incredible creativity that allows people to, to like kind of put the, the, the opponents or so in a, in a dilemma. Um, but yeah, I think a big part of it is like, Oftentimes people join gangs because they feel isolated from community and isolated from society. And if we can find a way to actually include them in the work that we're doing, um, it's a great way to, to turn that narrative around. Great, thank you. And Mel, you want to jump in and add something on the gang question? Well, I the last couple of months we've been doing um, unarmed civilian protection and nonviolence training with uh, young men in a gang diversion program in North Minneapolis. And, 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 and frankly, frankly I, oh, I'm getting, I'm getting echo, echoes. I, I, are you hearing an echo? Are you hearing an echo? Oh. oh. Uh, I, I don't know what's happening. Here. It's, it's probably someone who is not on mute. I think if the rest of us put ourselves on mute, then we wouldn't hear your echo. Okay, thanks, Guy. Um, 
And first of all, in training these young men, we found them much more engaged than uh, most of the groups that we work with, automatically jumping in on role plays and uh, being real about guns and about guns in the neighborhood and who has them. And that turned into last Tuesday, this group provided protection at two of the polls in their neighborhood. And on Saturday, they were part of an NP group that provided protection at a march uh, at the site of, of the uprising where most of the uh, businesses had been destroyed in the June uprising. And so we're working with them to continue to look at how they can apply uh, active nonviolence in their neighborhoods. Because they, going back to something Kazoo said, it, it, it provides meaning. It, it provides identity. Um, I, I, and that are, I, are two of the same elements. Those two are the same elements that, that gangs do. Thanks, Mel. Those are great points. Okay, we're running close on time here. We've got two more questions. Uh, I, one to Ken, and then I'm going to kick it back to Michael and Sarah. So, Ken, do you have any advice to protesters in Portland who are being harassed in their nonviolent stance and taking to prison? That's a question coming from Karen. As somebody who left Portland when he was eight years old, having lived there for five years, I'm not on the ground. And so it's very important that we are in these contexts and not just taking the word of certain media narratives. I do think this question of, that Michael was raising, of mis, uh, mistaking the tactic for the goal is really important here. So there is a huge amount of energy in Portland. Uh, how is that being organized and disciplined uh, to meet the, the goal of uh, uh, racial justice, reckoning with white supremacy, uh, building a, a, a new culture going forward? Uh, and then all the whole repertoire of nonviolent um, tactics are really necessary de-escalation and um, and so and so forth, but I do think it means a huge con uh, uh, conversation about um, uh, how how can we really meet the goal that we we want to see. Great, thanks, Ken. Uh, and a lot of these conversations around around tactic and strategy remind me, in very practical terms, a lot of the advice we give to our field teams, the nonviolent Peace Force field teams, it's all about flexibility and creativity. Uh, just how do they think about that on a day-to-day -day basis is don't get so dug in. And so for many of you who have seen the, the UCP wheel we use, which is our, we call it our toolbox, we always say that's mix and match. Um, so there's no singular answer. These are very complex problems and we really encourage the teams on the ground and we give them the freedom to do so. We, we delegate decision-making right down to the, to the field level so they can see what's in front of them, they can work and we really encourage them to be as creative as possible. If something's not working, don't get dug in on that. Shift your tactic a little bit and see, and, and, and just a change of energy can really change the way um, that people are receiving or engaging with you. So. All of this is, is, is put into practice all over, all over the place. Um, Michael and Sarah, we had a really lovely question here. Um, and the question is, if you only had one audience to see this, who would it be? It's a tough question. Uh I'm not sure what Michael just said, but um, I'll, I'll go ahead and say that one of my uh, biggest hopes and dreams for this film is that it could be seen by uh, veterans, by military, by police. Um, I worked very hard to make the film palatable to many audiences. I really tried to keep it away from being siloed and sort of progressive um, movement thought and try to open this up so that hopefully it can be effective in public schools all over the United States, not just in California and New York and 
Massachusetts. Um, so yeah, I mean, my hope would be for, for people in uniform to see this one way or another and maybe to start to use it. Um, I mean, we had uh, the Petaluma police chief, I believe was quite interested maybe in eventually possibly using it. Um, so that's an example of something I would love to see. Uh, thank you, Sarah. What I actually said was, you go ahead. <laughs> uh, gosh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking in less, the, less of a demographic audience than of a psychological profile audience. Uh, people who are hurting, who are uh, angry and coming and, and, it's, and now getting ready to really do something. If we could reach those people at that critical moment and show them what a better thing there is to do, that same energy as we've just been hearing from Mel and others, that same energy that's being used for destructive purposes could be channeled into constructive purposes. So, uh, you know, I, th I think primarily of young people, uh, just because my heart always goes out to them, but uh, for anyone who is stirred up by righteous indignation because they have in fact snuck away from Fox News and saw some truth somewhere and are, are you know, raring to do something, loaded for bear, as we used to say in the, sorry, Sarah, that was very offensive to you. <laughs> Sarah saves predators. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, people who are, are charged up getting ready to do something, they don't know what to do. They're very likely to do something destructive and fruitless. If we can catch them at that moment and show them the challenge of nonviolence, how, yes, you are gonna suffer, you're gonna risk, but you will suffer meaningfully. You will take risks the way Derek and Andres did in a context that actually elevates human consciousness. I don't a wonderful know. note to wrap up on. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, Sarah, all friends and colleagues who were part of making the film and everybody who's here with us today. Um, as always, the time passed by very quickly. There were a number of questions in the chat about having access to the film, looking for resources on some of the subject matter, uh, information about the board game, how to purchase that. So I am guessing we'll take care of that um, and make sure that we get that information out to everybody. Uh, we've just ordered a number of copies of the board game for the Nonviolent Peace Force offices um, around the world that we're gonna send out to them. Uh, so that's really exciting. We're waiting for those to arrive. Uh, Jilda, can I turn it back over to you to, to close us out and wrap us up? Absolutely. Thank you, Tiffany. And thank you to everyone who's spoken and to everyone who asked questions. Um, I've gotten so much out of this Zoom call. And I think that this is a moment for you to share with us. We're going to put a survey into the chat box. And we hope um, that you will take a moment to let us know how, what this call did for you uh, today. Um, how we might be able to improve. But another thing that we'd also like to, to ask you, and this was a request of Michael and Sarah's, is if you could also type into the chat box how you think this film could be useful to you or to your community. They would really love to know that so that they can plan and strategize how to meet those needs and how to help folks with this film. So before you leave this call, if you could take a look at the survey um, and also type into the chat box how you think this film might be useful to you or your community, that would be very helpful and we'd really appreciate it. There's one more thing that I want to share with you um, before we end this call, and that is to make a request to you to consider that we're coming upon our winter holidays. This is a time when we're feeling generous, we're feeling hopeful about the future. Um, and I would like to invite you to think about where you want to put your time, your energy, your support. Um, if you were inspired by what you heard today about nonviolence, perhaps that is the place where you should be putting your time, energy, treasure. Um, 
this is what will help you, I think, reach closer, all of us, help all of us to get closer to the world that we want. I've become a big fan lately of saying, if you believe that you get what you pay for, then I think we all really need to start considering nonviolence and peace as those things that we need to invest in. So I'm going to ask you to consider making a gift to any of the nonviolence organizations that you've heard about on this call to support their work and make it real uh, and not just a dream in our heart, but a little bit more than that so that we can have it in our reality. Um, and I wanna thank you all so much. I wanna let you know that Nonviolent Peace Force is also going to be supplying masks that were lovingly made in South Sudan and Myanmar and if you're also looking for a good gift to give this year, that might be a very good one. And of course, we always have peace bonds, which is our uh, alternative to war bonds. There, you know, people use these tools to create the uh, reality we want. So I suggest these options as loving gifts around this gift season. So I want to again encourage you to fill out that survey and also to type into the chat box how you think this film might be useful to you or to your community. And um, you would really assist everyone by doing that. So thank you everyone for joining this call. It's super special. I don't think anyone mentioned in that this film took about 15 years to make. I, um, I wanted to say that in the beginning so that you could understand how much of a commitment it was. But it's been an honor for me to watch it grow and become materialized and to be here with all of you and to share it. So thank you for joining us today. We're at our time. Please fill out the survey and please let us know how the film can be useful. And thank you all once again. May we all know peace and nonviolence.